Now obviously we are just coming up to five weeks from the 18th. Not very long, and I hardly understand how we got from it being two years and incredibly long, and we've got an infinite amount of time, and how are we going to get through it to, oh my goodness, there's no time left. But there really isn't any time left. So that's why it's really important that we let later on, we let the people who are don't knows, the people who have questions, the people who have concerns, to ask their questions. Because time is literally running out. And in a few weeks time, we're all going to be going into that booth with our piece of paper and our wee stubby pencil. And we're going to have to finally commit to yes or no. And the thing is, you can't depend on what's coming to you from the media. You have to do your homework. You have to weigh it up and then you have to make your own decision. And that decision is absolutely personal to you. I have no issue with people who are going to vote no because they completely believe in Britain and that is the important thing for them because they should vote no if that's what they believe. The people I worry about after the vote are the people who are going to be frightened into voting no because they've been told for the last two years that we couldn't do it. And I think when afterwards, whatever the vote is, it becomes clear that that isn't true, I think there are going to be some people who are very bitter. So you do need to really do your own homework. The idea that there isn't enough information out there isn't true. It just isn't in the newspaper that lands on your breakfast table. You actually have to go and look for it. Now what we're voting for is just whether we take control should Scotland be an independent country? It's not for a party, it's not for Alex Salmond, it's not for any particular policy. But it's do we take control, or do we give it back on the 19th, and after that we just say, well, that's okay, we'll let the big boys in Westminster do it, and some of the time we'll quite like what they decide to do. And to me that just seems like Russian roulette. I think we should vote yes to take control because then we wouldn't get decisions that we really don't agree with. And in my adult voting life, we've had some terrible decisions that I absolutely don't agree with, and I think most Scots don't agree with. We've been taken into quite a lot of wars from the Falklands in 82, when I was still at uni, through Afghanistan to Iraq, which people were out on the streets trying to protest against. We didn't really get a voice in that. We have weapons of mass destruction 30 miles from our biggest city. I don't really think we'd have chosen to do that. Not exactly the safest place if you live in Glasgow. Probably not terribly great for us down here, I have to say, we're not that far away. What we've heard in the last week or so is that the central belt of Scotland has been zoned for fracking. And there wasn't even so much as a phone call to the Scottish government. So I think that we would make better decisions when we would make these decisions because we have a vested interest in it. It's our country. What we've also seen over that same period of time is a relentless move of public resources that we have built, that we've paid for out of our taxes, being moved into private hands. From when Brit Oil, where we used to own the oil, was privatised to become BP, through rail, through the energy companies, recently the Royal Mail, which was sold off at bargain basement prices. And we haven't got a better service out of that. We're the ones who've built all the things with the tax money, and yet we pay through the nose service. The subsidies to what would have been British Rail are higher now than it was before it was privatised and yet we're paying higher charges. So it's not this idea that private is good and public is bad is just not true. And what we're seeing now happening south of the border is we're seeing the NHS in England being sold off. And the reason that I started speaking out about it at the end of February was that I was aware of this and I saw that our media just didn't mention a word. Now we could easily think kindly of them, that they thought, well, it doesn't matter for the ball, it's not relevant to us. But I'm sorry, it's very relevant to us. Our funding is based on their funding. As their funding withers away, our funding will wither away. 
And what has happened in the last year since the coalition brought in their new act is that all services are commissioned by small groups of GPs and every single one of them must be put out to tender between the NHS and private companies. And in that first year, 70% of all those contracts have gone to private companies like Virgin, like Atos, like G4X. And they're managing to make money out of it. So how are they managing to make money? Well, one of the things I came across recently is they just changed the grades of staff. So staff who are at whatever level of, of training or seniority, the whole staff all get brought down a grade. Now, they don't work for the NHS anymore, they work for Virgin. They don't really have a union, and there's no other employer. So there's nothing they can do about it. That's how they make the money. They, they bring down what they pay staff. They cut corners, they minimize staff. Their motivation is the money. Now, the problem is that's also infecting the NHS hospitals. Because if they lose a contract, they're not getting paid for that anymore. So if a hip and knee contract goes to Virgin, your local hospital, say at Crosshouse, they, they don't provide a hip and knee service anymore because they didn't win the service. So either the staff have to get taken over by Virgin or they'll be laid over. So what you have is that a piece of NHS becomes private. And in five years when that franchise is finished, there is no NHS hip and knee service to even bid to bring it back into the NHS. So this is a relentless one-way street of moving things that we built, hospitals we built, equipment we built with our taxes into private hands for them to make money out of. Now up till now it's been predominantly the cheap, lucrative, easy things, like coming and having an operation, where you come in, you get your operation, you go home, they don't see you again. And they can make lots of money out of that. What they're not interested in is if you have a chronic illness, like you've had a stroke, or you are a diabetic, or you have anything else that is disabled, because that's far too expensive. And it's gonna go on and on and on. They're not interested in that. If you have a complex cancer, if you have a bad accident and you're in intensive care, well, they're not interested in any of that. So what's happening down south is the remaining NHS hospitals who are dealing more and more with that kind of patient, rather than having any of the straightforward cases, they're obviously getting proportionally more expensive. And at the end of just one year of these changes, more than 40% of all English trusts are in debt. Some of them massive debt. Farts in London, 50 million pounds. They have ended up that they are more than 700 million pounds in debt. The government had to put an extra 500 million in to bail some of them out, and yet they're still between one and 200 over even that. So that's just one year of these changes. Now part of that, there is a health economist down south, Alison Pollock, that's A-L-L-Y-S-O-N. You find her on YouTube. She's based down in London. And she has spoken out about the changes. And as she points out, what we are on a direction towards is Mrs. Thatcher's dream of an insurance-based system. She talked about that in the 80s, and the NHS was not in any position to provide anything remotely like an American system. But that was her vision, and that is where we're headed. And the administration cost of that is 30 to 40% of all the funding meaning you've only got 60 to 70% of your DOSH to actually spend it on people. The kind of our method of funding the NHS, just straight out of tax, no pretending, that costs about 6% to 10% in admin costs. Now what they say is it's to cut costs and increase efficiency. And yet the Commonwealth Fund report for 2014, which was published a few months ago, ranks the UK systems based on 2011 to 2013, so before these changes, as number one in the world. They came top in eight out of 11 parameters. They came second in one, third in one. The only one they did badly in was life expectancy. And the report authors described that this was more to do with socioeconomic problems and out with the scope of a healthcare system. So, number one, by miles. Well, we must be really expensive. They tell us it can't go on. 
No, second cheapest in the world. We are less than half the price per head that America is. So if we're the number one and we are the second cheapest, in what way can we cut costs and increase efficiency? I'm sorry, this is ideological. And that's the problem. For the last 30 years, regardless of what color of government we've had in Westminster, they have had one ideological thing in common. The market rules. Big business rules. We are just cannon fodder for multinationals. And everything should be moved out of public sphere into private. And they say it will be so much more efficient and we will be so better served. I don't think people who are sitting in a cold flat trying to pay uh, Scottish power or whatever their bills would necessarily agree with that. So we need to be very clear about that. What happened in Scotland in 99 when we got devolution is we went totally in the other direction. We got rid of Mrs Thatcher's trust. Some of you here will remember when Air and Crosshouse were Air Hospital Trust, Crosshouse Hospital Trust. And we were meant to pretend to compete with each other which even of itself was inefficient. We went back from that to being a single, public, unified NHS. And as Ben touched on, I had the honor to be involved in the Clinical Standards Board and Quality Improvement Scotland, which was about setting up quality standards for the care of a lot of important diseases. Many types of cancer, heart disease, childhood diseases, so that everyone had standards they were working to. And what we set up was audit so that every year we meet and we compare our performance to each other in a meeting like this. Well, it, well maybe not as many people, a <laughs> slightly bigger room. Um, and everyone's data is put up on a slide and we criticize each other and we discuss with each other, but we also share solutions that we have come up with. And you're not gonna find M&S and Debenhams doing that anytime soon, sharing the ideas on how to increase sales. That's what we have, is we have cooperation and collaboration. What they have down south is now competition. Because even the NHS hospitals are in a fight to the death. If they don't win a contract, if they can't cut their costs, if they can't minimize staff costs so as to win a contract, then they're gonna go out of business. And we have seen this happening relentlessly. And devolution is not enough to save us. Because number one, as you all know, and as uh, Ivan mentioned, we get our funding through Barnet. When they cut, which they plan to do, our health budget shrinks. We know that Barnet is under threat because the Welsh government and many of the Tory backbenchers are keen to get rid of it all together. That would take about four billion out of our block grant, and that's about a third of the NHS budget in Scotland. George Osborne already <coughs> announced £25 billion pounds worth of cuts that will start after the election. £2 billion will be our share of that. So that's going to come anyway. And there's a final nasty little thing that's coming that's only beginning to be talked about by people, and that's TTIP. This is a free trade agreement between the EU and America, which is to open up all markets to American companies and supposedly America to European companies. Now that means an American company can go into anything that is a market. NHS England is now a market. And the problem is, if we vote no and we're just a little region, then that will be considered a trade barrier. That will not protect us from American companies pushing in. And what they will be doing is obviously looking for as many contracts as they can get. Now, many other European countries have asked for their health services and certain other public services to be exempt. But weirdly, Westminster hasn't. And to me, I think, thinking of Mrs. Thatcher's dream, they may see that as the fastest way to make the fourth step of actually getting to a full insurance-based system because that would happen very swiftly when American companies would come in. And that's something that we need to be aware of. So the idea as people say, oh, this is all nonsense, you're devolved, nothing can ever happen to you. I'm not talking about next year, I'm not talking about two years, but I'm talking about 10 years time. They are talking a lot about charges down south, 10 to 25 pounds 
to see a GP or A&E. This is being bandied about by think tanks, it's in the press, it's on talk shows. So people down south are being softened up for this. That will cut their spending even further. And like higher education, where the children pay, or the young people pay, 9,000 a year, that will cut our budget. So the idea that under devolution, we are sitting in some safe place and can just have the status quo, I'm afraid is naive. Now the problem with the NHS is it can't <coughs> give you health. It can help you when you're ill. It can catch you when you're full. But what actually gives you health is a good start in life. What actually gives you health is PE at school, is active walking, is opportunities, is not ending up on drugs and drink because you've grown up in such deprivation you think life isn't worth living. That's what gives you health. And that's what we've been stuck with, this sick man of Europe label, for decades and decades. It was improving between the Second World War and the late 70s. But since the 80s, with the big surge in unemployment and deindustrialization, it just became ingrained again. And we can't fight that unless we have control. Unless we can look at, not trickle down economics, where Boris Johnson describes we might get the odd drop of jam that falls off the edge of the toast, but trickle up economics. If you put money where people do not have a lot of money, they spend it. So it goes to the shop. It goes from the shopkeeper to whoever supplied the shopkeeper, from them to the manufacturer, then to the manufacturer's wife who goes out and does more shopping. The money goes round and round and round the economy. If you push money to the rich through tax cuts and selling things off to your pals, which is what we've had for the last decade, that money either stagnates in the bank or it even goes offshore. So if we were paying people a living wage, so that if people have done a decent week's work, they actually have a salary they can live on, we would already start to change some of these things. And that's what we need to do. It's not just icing, it's not just at the edges. It's the opportunity to actually re-knit Scotland to be the way we want it. And that won't be easy. The idea that on the 25th of March 2016 you'll wake up and it'll, there'll be like manna all over the lawn and honey dripping off the bushes, you know, that ain't going to happen. But it is the opportunity to change it. And we're the generation who have the opportunity to make that decision. We're the generation who have the responsibility to make that decision for our children and their children so that they don't get taken to a war they don't agree with, that they don't lose free education, that they don't lose an NHS that takes care of people. That's who we're deciding for. But we're also a generation who have to accept that the next 10 years would be hard work. It's not sitting back. We've all been out, we've been campaigning, going to meetings, doing our homework. <laughs> But it then wouldn't be about sitting back, it wouldn't at all be job done. So on the 19th, we don't go back in our boxes. We prepare for a decade of really, really hard work, but exciting work. Imagine the chance to be part of that, of remaking Scotland. So when you go into that wee booth, you need to take your courage in your hands, you need to think about all the people in Scotland that that little mark is for, and vote yes. Thank you. Thank you.